All right, so I'm Dennis. Uh, I don't think anyone knows me here yet, but uh, um, I'll be talking about access control systems. I've set up a little demo there. Uh, some of you guys have seen something like this. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just dive straight into it. Um, so since this is a 30 minute talk and it's made for a 50 minute talk, you're gonna see me go a little fast through this and I'm gonna be skipping a lot of you know, kind of the more technical information just to, to save time. So, but uh, if anyone's interested in the full talk, I'll be giving it tomorrow at 12 at DEF CON 101 track. So, okay, so I'm Dennis Maldonado. Uh, oops, something is wrong with this PowerPoint. So something is wrong with that slide, uh, but that's me. Yeah, I'm on Twitter, Dennis Maldonado. I'm a security researcher at KLC Consulting. Uh, I do a lot of stuff like hacking access control systems or whatever they tell me to hack. So, uh, so what is a physical access control system? So physical access control, a lot of you guys have seen this. If you've lived in an apartment complex, gated community, visited some commercial or shared office spaces, you've seen a box kind of like this uh, uh, where you know, maybe you walk up to it, type in a number, and uh, it, you know, it calls someone, they tr press nine on their phone and it lets them in. So, that's an access control system. Uh, they do things like they control doors, they can open and close doors, gates, elevators, um, barrier arms, you know, stuff that you see around downtown or an apartment or you know, some of higher end homes. Um, so how do they work? Well, to open these doors that they control, they have a physical, you know, there's a bunch of ways you can get in. You can type on that keypad over there, there's little transmitters, you can do this. You know, when you, if, you, if you have the right key, it'll let you in when you press the button. There's RFID, there's, you know, there's plenty of ways you can do to allow, get this device to allow you in. Uh, and quick, I'm gonna recap, I'm gonna talk about this demo real quick. I have here an access controller. It's just like one you see in an apartment, it's hooked up the same way. The only difference is, since I don't have an actual door, uh, I have four numbers, and each number represents a door. So when you see one light up like that, door three has now opened, or door two, I believe it's lit up. Uh, yeah, there you go, is now open. Uh, so you'll see you know, those doors. You'll actually never see door one open because during my experimentation, I didn't really read the manual and I blew up the relay that controls door one. It literally exploded. So you'll never see one light up, but that's all right, you're not gonna need to. So let's moving on. Uh, where do you see these things? You see these, again, like I said, gated communities, parking garages, apartments, uh, hotels, you know, pretty much anywhere where they want to control uh, access to certain places. So you have many different vendors, like the one I have here. Uh, you have Door King is a, one vendor. You've probably seen some of these. Chamberlain, Syntex, these, all are, these are all starting to look familiar if you guys ever used one or walked up to one. And then you have Linear. Uh, just like this one over here is a Linear brand. Uh, they have many different models. Um, so here's some use cases. Here's some I've, I've, I've seen in the field. Uh, these were outside downtown Austin. Uh, you can just walk up to the building and start using them. Uh, they take keypads, some take RFID cards, uh, whatever you want, right? Uh, here's some in front of, uh, one in front of an apartment complex and another one in front of an office building where cars just drive up and either type in a special code or swipe their badge against the reader. Uh, more examples of other you know, units. Uh, you've got elevators, they can control elevators too. And uh, here you see what in a networking closet, there's three of them, these three gray boxes, they're set up, they have no keypad or anything to them, they're just set up to, uh, to, uh, to interface with card readers on doors in other locations, so they all come to one network closet. Uh, and so inside those gray boxes are little devices like this. It's pretty much the same thing as I have here on this table, but without the display, without a keypad, it's just used for maybe RFID scanning or maybe expanding off of this to add more, you know, ability to control more doors. Uh, so this one's pretty funny because you can, you'll never guess where I found this one. Right there, in a the toilet. So on the seventh floor of some building in the bathroom, there's a little gray box. So curious, you know, me being curious what's in it, I open it and sure enough, it's a little access controller that controls access to the building. So I thought that was pretty funny. Um, all right. So linear access control. So now that we talked about what access control really is, uh, I'll talk about a specific vendor. Uh, and the only reason why I'm focusing on this vendor is not to, not to say how bad they are, but it's just the interest of time. 
Uh, I only had a lot of time, enough time to focus researching on this vendor. Plus, it's expensive. This box costs seventeen hundred dollars to buy on your own, so <laughs> not going to buy more than one of those. Uh, so linear has many different models. They're all the same. I won't go into detail because they're all pretty much the same. This one here is the one you see on the left, the AE one thousand. There's the AE2000, which is the same thing, just a bigger screen, and the AM3 Plus, which again is the same thing, just with no screen. Um, so these, these are pretty cool. They have a lot of functionality. They utilize a telephone line, so you can you know, call someone to let you in. Uh, they also they support thousands of users, so they're great for large installations like big apartments or shared offices. Uh, they're networked. They can be networked with other controllers so that you can you know, have more than one of these in different locations. and have ability to you control more doors and such. And the best part is, and we'll be talking about a lot, is they can, can be configured and even controlled through a PC, through a serial connection. So let's talk a little bit about how it connects. So we're not going to talk too much about this, but this is the device it uses to turn a serial connection into a conventional TCP IP connection. And this is what, what, this is, what is normally used uh, in most big installations to allow management to remotely monitor, control, uh, the, uh, the access control system from wherever they are. Uh, so typical installation is you have it like this. Uh, you, you've seen these on the walls and whatever. Here's what's happening behind the scenes. You have um, the AE1000 Plus controller, and that's hooked up through a serial cable to the serial to TCP device. That would allow this controller to connect to the network, and so then that device is connected via Ethernet cable to a network router or a switch or whatever network you want, and then you have another management PC anywhere in the network or even on the internet because this can be enabled for the internet. You'll have that management PC communicating with the controller and pushing you know, new users to it or opening doors from the computer and so on and so forth. So how does that management PC communicate it uh, with the controller? Well, it uses a software called Access Space 2000. It's a software developed by uh, the guys at Linear uh, where you can add and remove users, you can you know, add entry codes, you can add specific transmitters to allow them access to the device. Um, you can manually toggle relays, and tog the relay is what controls the door. So when you toggle a relay, you open or close that door, depending on you know, what the current state of the door is. Uh, you can view log reports. These things do, uh, do, do logging as, uh, pretty well. Um, you can, it, it communicates through serial, uh, of the, you know, the computer talks to the serial to TCP uh, device like I have here and then it interfaces with the controller. And it does require a password to authenticate. You do need a password. Uh, in, the, in this application, in that circle box, uh, that, that little circle over there, you type in a password. And this is interesting because the password is required to work with the controller, but the password's only six digits. It's exactly six digits, numbers only. So that means there's, only, uh, there's a possibility of only a, a million passwords exactly, right? So we'll talk about that in a second. So how does it communicate exactly? Well, when someone's using the software on the computer, they, uh, they, they use the software, and the software sends a specific request, a string of data to the controller. And the controller will respond back either acknowledge, meaning the, data, the command is good and it did a job, or not acknowledge, meaning the command is bad and it didn't do anything. Uh, invalid checksum, if the, if the message is broken somehow, let's say the bad connection, it'll come spit back invalid checksum, the message is invalid. Or no response. If you don't have that password, it's not going to respond at all. So that's that. Let's let's just dive right into the attacks. Uh, we, can, we don't want to spend too much time on the technical stuff, so let's go to the attacks. So, how do we target these controllers? Well, there's many ways you can target these, right? You, you've you've all walked up to one, driven up to one, or whatever. Physical access is probably the easiest thing to get to these controllers because they're meant to be walked up to and to press, you know, mess with. So one thing you can do is possibly lo program them locally. Uh, you, th there's functionality where you can program them locally. You don't have to use a computer. And that's for the mo smaller installations. Uh, there's also a serial port inside of these controllers uh, if you do want to program it from a computer. So let's talk about local attacks. Let's talk about how we can do stuff like local programming or hijack the serial port. So default password. So you have the AE500. The AE500 is pretty much a smaller version of what I have on the table. Uh, it's, it only supports two doors instead of four, and it cannot be controlled from a computer uh, because it's made for much simpler installations. Like say, let's say one, one door, one gate in front of some very rich house or something like that. Uh, so these things can be programmed uh, from the keypad themselves. 
Uh, and so how do you do that? You hold zero and two, and when you do that, you get a password prompt that's asking you for the password. You type the default password, one, two, three, four, five, six. What I've noticed is that in the documentation, this states that one, two, three, four, five, six is the default password, and who changes that, right? When you're installing this, who thinks to change it? Obviously, the installers that you're paying you know, the lowest bid contract for uh, is not gonna worry about security, so they haven't changed it. And to be honest, most of these that I've seen in the field are always the default password. So try the default password. If it doesn't work, you can try common passwords like 1111 So let's say the default password works. So one, two, three, four, five, six pound. Now we're in programming mode. Now we can do whatever we want. So what we do is we input a command to add a new entry code. Uh, and that's gonna be 31 pound 999, pound 999, pound 999, pound. So I'll go into that in the next slide, uh, what that means. And once, once you're in, all you have to, once you're done with that, all you have to do is type 9999, which is your new entry code that no one knows about, and access grants it. So what did we just do? Let's recap that. So first thing we did is we did 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We entered programming mode by holding 0, 2 and doing the default password and pressing pound as enter. Pound is your enter screen. Uh, next, we, we entered entry code programming mode by typing in 31 pound. That, that allows us to enter a new entry code. Then we enter our entry code. In this case, I chose 9999. You can do 1337, 1111, whatever you want. Uh, the next thing you have to do is just confirm it, just type it again, just so it knows that you didn't make a mistake. And then 99 pound, exit programming mode. Now you're out, all you have to do is type your new entry code and you're in. So I'll show you how quick and easy it is to do that. So I did it here and let's do that. There you go. That's it. So this is a it was this was like completely flashed to, to, to default settings. I didn't have an entry code before. In less than ten seconds, I was able to quickly put in the default password, program my entry code, and get in. And and it's that easy. So what's the use of these devices if they're not really protecting you? Uh, you just you just gotta be careful. Uh, with making sure you change the default password and you, you, know, you, you, you don't want to be vulnerable to something like that. So another problem, what if the password is not default and it's something else? Well, what I found out is master key. Uh, these devices, there's a little key slot on this device here to lock it so people can't get inside and mess with the internal components. Well, I found out that after acquiring this device, it came with a key like one I'm holding here in my hand and, and the one here in pictured, which is by the way the same key, and they're all the same. This box, the AE1000 Plus that I have right here on this table, if you see anyone in front of your apartment or, what, or whatever, it's gonna be the same key most likely. They come shipped default with the same key. So I have the key in my hand, I can get in your apartment if it's using that. Uh, the, not only the AE1000 Plus, other versions of models like the AM3 Plus that I found in the bathroom, same key. Uh, you can, you can purchase this key. Uh, of course, if you want to spend $1,700, you can buy that and it comes with a key. Or you can actually, you know, if you're lucky, try to find a key on eBay or find maybe someone selling the enclosure, a plastic little enclosure itself that locks and comes with the key. That's only going to be 100 bucks because it doesn't come with any of the components. So try to find the key. Or uh, if you want, you can pick the lock. I'm sure people have talked about lock picking here already. Uh, you can, this is a fairly easy lock to pick, so nothing special. Uh, and when you open it, it gives you full access to the device. So let's go into, um, oh, real quick before. Um, by the way, that, like I said, that is the key. So this PowerPoint is gonna be uploaded. You can always just you know, go over there and make a copy of the key from what you see in that picture. So, uh, but yeah, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Uh, so what does opening this box with the key give you? It gives you physical access to the components. So what can you do? Well, there's, in this, there's manual relay, uh, manual relay latch buttons. So let's say something happens and the door is stuck closed or stuck open and you know, pressing this button doesn't work. Let's say that wouldn't work. Well, someone can go in there and press the button to just open the door. So I'll do it real quick. All right, so you can also lock their state. When you press that button, uh, 
now that button is pressed forever until you press the button again or turn off and turn on the controller. So just, you know, if you want to keep a door open or a gate open in the community, the complex, you can have your party come in to your apartment without having to let people in. Just, you can do that, right? Um, Oh, by the way, remember I said Relay 1 exploded? That you kind of see it there. There's this little you know, charredness over there. Re yeah, that, that happened, so yeah, I don't want to talk about it. Okay, programming buttons. There's also programming buttons in this device right, located where that arrow is, and you can use that to program it in certain circumstances. Or if you just want to be mean, uh, you can, you can uh, just erase the firmware and you know, make it forget all the devices. Uh, there's also an active phone line if you want to mess with that and a serial connection to the controller, uh, and we'll talk about some attacks you can do with that next. Uh, another thing is there's a tamper sw uh, monitor. There's a little magnet on the side that's going to allow you to, uh, th th sorry, that's going to, uh, that's used so that people can know when the device has actually been opened with that key or not. Uh, so the thing is there's no active alerts. It's really hard to, to actually know that someone's opened it. You have to go pull the logs manually. Uh, another problem is it can also be bypassed by a big magnet. So let me show you how to do that. So again, there's a tamper, oops, wrong button. Uh, let's see, click, there you go. There's a tamper switch on the side, that little white thing. And so you see, as I open the controller, it lets me know that the controller has been opened and closed. You saw it update live. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna carefully put this 80 pound magnet, well, it has 80 pound of pulling force, this magnet on the side, gloves to protect myself, and now when I open the controller, you're going to see nothing happens. The logs have no idea that the controller has been opened. So I open it, and no, no update. Those are the old entries. I'm going to close it again. Nothing happens. The controller has no idea it's been opened because the magnet is literally disabling that tamper detection switch. So see, same old, same old. So moving on. So we've talked about, uh, about physical access. Now let's talk about the fun stuff. Let's talk about how to uh, remote access. Uh, talking to these devices on the network, whether it be internal, you're, maybe you plug into a cable in the leasing office of an apartment, or external, these things are connected to the internet, which are, as they often are. Uh, again, these devices communicate through, uh, through a network connection. Uh, instead of uh, having to specify a serial port, you can specify an IP address and port, which makes things a lot easier, makes, allows you to use it on Linux or Mac or whatever. Uh, you can communicate with this effectively. Uh, same thing the computer does to communicate with the controller, a bad guy can do the same thing too if they find the IP address of this device. So let's talk about some remote attacks. So first, I'm gonna quickly do a, a demo. So here is the application. Uh, oof, the text is not very good there, so hopefully you guys will be understand anyway, but to connect to it, you have this application, and just click this button here to connect to the device. But you see the problem is, I'll read that back to you. <laughs> it says wrong password. It's not going to connect because the password's incorrect. Remember, we need that password. So how do we, how do we solve that issue as an attacker? Can I, can I get, there you go. Brute force attack. Remember, the password is exactly six digits, numbers only. We can brute force this easily. There's no rate limiting, so I can keep guessing. Uh, the, uh, there's no rate limiting, so I can send it as fast as the connection will allow. There's no password lockout, so I can keep guessing. And again, it's small. I can, there's only one million possible passwords. And you can script this. You can just keep sending this data, and it'll respond back whether the password's good or not. So let me quickly demonstrate that. I know I'm running out of time here, so we'll go quick. So we have the wrong password. So I'm gonna, I've wrote a Python script that'll do this, ACAT brute force. Uh, so what it's doing now is it's guessing the password. It's, it's trying combinations and then it's gonna start from 000 to 99 or whatever. Uh, you'll see it's trying more than once because what it's doing is it keeps trying a password till it gets a valid response, whether it's incorrect or whether it's correct. Uh, and then once it gets an actual valid response that the password's incorrect, it moves on, it increments and keeps guessing the password. Yes, this may take about, I don't know, four days if it goes through the entire key space, but it's still doable. So as it's, as it's brute forcing, it'll report. And there you go. Success, the master code in this case is 000051. So let's try that. If we go to setup, network, go here, type in the password, one, two, three, four, five, one. There you go. And connect. There you go. Now I'm connected with the, with the Access Space 2000 software. I can go here and, for example, trigger. There you go. The, the relays, have now, the doors have now been opened and I have access to the complex. I can also, if I want to, add or you know, delete users, right? 
So, all right, so that's brute force attack. So what, what else can we do? Well, these things need a password, right? Turns out, mm, maybe not really. Uh, they need a password to use that application, but it turns out if you send a specific request on your own without the, the software, if you send that request to the controller, it won't respond back. It won't tell me that the request is good because I don't have the password, but it'll still execute that request. You know, it, it'll still take an unauthenticated command and perform the job that it was told to do. And I mean, as simple as that, authentication is not really needed. So I send, send, the, send data and just, you know, forget the password, just go right around it, right? So what can I do with that? Open doors remotely, of course. Send one simple command, and in this case, that's a command to open a, a, a specific door, and the controller just executes it. It just does it. Okay, door open. Sure, it won't tell me that the door is open, but the door is open, who cares? Um, it's great for movie style scenes. You've, you you have that movie where you know you've got a hacker in the uh, in the van, and there's a bunch of jewelry thieves trying to get in, and the hacker says go and presses a, the, something on his keyboard, and boom, the jewelry thieves are in the museum without having to uh, to to break any windows, and all of a sudden the Declaration of Independence is stolen. Okay, so another thing you can do is you can lock doors. Uh, you can lock these states, the, the, the states of the doors, so you can keep them closed and keep them open. And the only way to fix that is to unlock them uh, or reboot the controller. So some scenarios, oh, it, it, and when you lock them, they won't respond to anything. Right now, door two is opening, but once I lock the relays, nothing would happen. And so you can keep all the doors or gates locked so people can't get in or out, uh, or you can keep them open so anyone can get in and you can have that super awesome party that your parents wouldn't allow you to have. So. Uh, again, persists until manually unlocked or rebooted. Um, and another thing you can do is, if you do want the password so you can use that Access Space 2000 software, you don't need to know the password. You don't need to brute force it. You can just change it. Turns out you can push a firmware update to these devices that, has, that contains a default password or any password you want, and it'll take it, it'll change the password, and it'll remain functional uh, working with the normal, you know, people that are allowed to be using it. So, uh, why even brute force it where you can just change it? So, uh, moving on, uh, denial of service. Last thing, I'll, last attack I'll talk about is if you want to be really mean and just, uh, you know, deny access to that, you can fake a database update and now all of a sudden that's no longer able to be used. You know, once. If it's, if it's trying to do a database update, I send it a message to do a database update, but ne never tell it to stop. And once it's doing that, it won't take commands until a database update is done. And to fix that, you have to reboot the controller. Another thing you can do is you can overwrite the device firmware, and that will completely just erase, you know, make it completely use, unusable until someone fixes it. And like we talked about, you can lock the relays, lock the doors. So I'll quickly just go over a quick and easy tool that I, just, uh, that I created just to do uh, for all those attacks that we've talked about. So, I have a tool here. Oops, let's, let's kind of disc, I left that on. Okay. So I have a tool here, it's really easy. It's, it's kind of point and click, as point and click as you can get for a command line. Uh, this doesn't authenticate with any password, it just, I point it to the IP address of the controller and I can do, now I can do anything here. So, trigger relays, let's do that. So all I have to do is type one, two, three, four, and you'll see all the relays, except one, because it exploded, all the relays have opened, and as simple as that. I found this device on the network, or I found it on the internet, I use this tool, and everything's open. Uh, you can lock the doors, so let's say I lock, them, I lock two open. Two now stays open until I reboot the device or manually unlock it, and if I try to do anything, nothing happens, it stays open. Let's lock it closed now, let's lock two closed. Now two stays closed, and again, nothing will work. Nothing will open. And then if I do want to fix it because I'm not that mean, I'll unlock it. Two is unlocked, and two can be opened again. One Another thing you can do is uh, if you upload the default configuration, I'm not going to demo that because it'll take some time, uh, that'll replace the default password. Uh, and of course, denial of service. So you have one, uh, you, have, you have this thing working properly, two and three, right? If you do denial of service, been, it's been sent, now you can't see it, but if you walked up to the screen, it'll say database update in progress, and it'll say that forever until I tell it to stop. And nothing happens, no lights, no doors open, and so it completely makes it unusable, and let's stop it. So let's stop it, 
10, boom. Everything works again. So that's the quick tool. Uh, I'll be working a lot more on that tool. Uh, it's a prototype for now. And so final thoughts. Let, I'll close it off because I'm starting to get over time. Uh, I, I didn't do this talk to, uh, to, to just say that this vendor is bad because they're not. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, kind of bring attention to these issues because if one vendor has these issues, other vendors are going to have similar issues as well. So uh, just be in mind that just because you don't use linear specifically doesn't mean you're not, you're not, you know, you don't have security issues and you're complex. Uh, on, this is ongoing research. Uh, I am not done at all. I'm doing more research on this device, on other vendors as well, so this is ongoing. Uh, that tool, I have released that tool. Uh, it's currently still just a prototype, but I'll continue to make updates. Anyone can also contribute. It's on GitHub. You can reach it there. Uh, and the slides. The slides will be uploaded as well. Uh, the full version of these slides, this is the cut down for, for, for the 30 minute talk. The full version will, is online. I'll actually be giving this full talk tomorrow at DEF CON 101 at 12 for 50 minutes. If you guys want to come out for more information about it, uh, I'll be there. And um, so that's it. So uh, I'm out of time. So if you want questions, I'm going to pack all this up now. You can tweet me. You can meet me right here at DEF CON 23. I'll linger around for a bit and then walk down and do more practice for this talk. And then uh, you can always email me as well. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you guys very much.